Before we get into today's video, I do want to let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know. <laughs> Y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. Random thought while we get started. I have been getting a ton of compliments. Thank you guys, love you guys so, so, so much. Um, on my face, people are saying that I'm glowing and that my skin looks good. But I think it may be my skincare routine. Thank you guys. I did add vitamin C oil to my skincare routine, if you guys care. All right, so let's get into it. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about America's most prolific serial killer out there. Yes, Samuel Little. I got away with uh, numerous murders of women in my life over a span of 50 years. This man has claimed to have killed 93 women, at least 93 women. And you know, sometimes when people claim to have killed that much, they're just making things up or maybe they, you know, got some issues or whatever, but the police have confirmed over 60. So they are believing that Samuel Little did kill 93 people. Now that's, this is across many different states. And before we get into this story though, which is another bizarre, crazy story, I want to talk about how charming this man was, just like a lot of other serial killers, like, you know, Teddy, y'all know who Teddy is, right? Old Jeffrey Dom Dom, y'all know who I'm talking about, trying to keep it together here because YouTube is really testing me, but we know about that. These men are very, very charming, were considered good looking. I definitely think Samuel Little, when he, and we, and he was in his younger years, very, very good looking man. And I think we need to keep note of that. We'll talk about that later on in the end of the video, but so let's just get started here and start at the beginning. I'm gonna tell y'all who Samuel Little even was. Samuel Little was born in 1940 in Reynolds, Georgia. He claimed that his mother was a prostitute and he also claimed that he was born in prison. So according to him, his mother was a worker and she got pregnant, had him in prison, and then basically disappeared most of his childhood. And from there, he was raised by his grandmother. Now, while he was raised by his grandmother, they did move to Ohio. And when he went to elementary school there, I listened to an interview by him when he said that when he was in elementary school, he became fascinated by women's necks to the point that he even said when he was five years old in elementary school, he had a teacher that would always touch her neck while she was teaching or while she was sitting at the desk and he would get excited at five years old by the teacher touching her neck. So he had this like fascination and like obsession with necks. In high school, he was constantly in trouble. He said he had trouble learning, and then he eventually dropped out. At 15 years old, he got in trouble for stealing, and he got sent to like this boys' reform school. And from there, he was basically getting in trouble as well. There, he had like I think almost 50 disciplinary actions written on him while he was there, and he was there for a year and a half. So he was there for a year and a half, and that basically obviously did not help him at all because he stayed in trouble the whole time he was there as well. Not long after he was released from there, when he was 16, he was sent to a juvenile facility for getting in trouble as well. So he just, he just stayed on that path ever since basically school. When he got into school, he was getting into trouble all the way up to dropping out and just stayed on this road of destruction. By his late 20s, he did reconnect with his mother and he moved to Florida with her. Now he says that he worked as like an ambulance assistant. He worked in an ambulance and then he also worked in a cemetery. So he said he had two jobs. That's never been confirmed, but according to him, that's what he was doing. And in 1970, 
according to Samuel, is when he made his first killing and got his first victim. He was out one night in Miami, Florida, uh, New Year's Eve at a bar, and he met a 33-year-old woman named Mary. So he's sitting up at the bar, he's talking to Mary, and she's just smitten with him. Now, when you watch videos of Samuel Little, and I'm gonna leave them down below, he's very charming, okay? Even when he was older, when he was like 80 years old, and he was a good-looking 80-year-old man, in my opinion. So, you know, young, good-looking, very charming, very well-spoken. He's up at the bar, it's New Year's Eve, he's talking to Mary, she is just smitten and being wooed by him. At this point, Mary tells Samuel that she is down there because she basically was in a rift with her family. Her family kind of felt like she drank too much and she had a drinking problem. According to her family, she did, but she was going to, you know, get stop drinking as much and take care of her children and stuff like that. But she meets Samuel at this bar. She tells him that her family lives out of state and he sees this as his perfect opportunity. Here's this woman here sitting at a bar all alone. Okay. She has no family or anything down here. Nobody's going to know where she's at or who she's with. And he decides that she's going to be his first victim. Mary decides she is going to leave with Samuel. So she gets into the car with him. They drive off down to a secluded area. She climbs on top of his lap. They're probably, you know, getting ready to get hot and heavy. And at this point, she starts playing with his chain that he has on him, straddling him in the car. And he takes his hands and he puts them around her neck that he is obsessed with. And he strangles her to death. 23 days later, her body is found. But at this point, she's so decomposed, they didn't even know who she was. Her body was not even actually identified as her by her teeth until 2017. So it was almost 40 years later. They did not know whose body that this was that they found. At this point, Samuel became like a nomad or a gypsy, you know, or whatever. He was traveling from place to place, never really settling in one spot. And he meets this woman in 1972 named Jean. Now, Jean would become his girlfriend of 16 years, okay? She was his ride or die. They would go steal stuff. They would go into like Sears and Walmarts and stuff stuff like that or whatever stores that there was around back then. They would steal stuff and sell it and travel around together. But this did not stop Samuel from killing during this time at all. So I don't know what Jean was doing, if she was staying at the house and he was doing whatever, but she was with him for 16 years and he did not slow down on his 93 woman spree. During this time, Samuel had many run-ins with the law, a mini many DUIs, fraud, assault. I mean, he was getting in trouble all over the place. He was arrested in eight different states. Now you got to think about it too. This is in the 1970s. There's not the internet like there is now. So if he's getting arrested in different states, he's just moving to a different state. By 1975, he had been arrested over 25 times. He did end up getting like some little jail and prison time. You know, he would get arrested and serve a little bit of time here, serve a little bit of time there. And I think he served about 10 years total over the years. He said he spent his time in prison learning how to box. So he claimed, was a self-proclaimed like prize fighter, you know, where people would like bet on him for fighting. And that he said that when he got out of jail or when he got out of prison, that he was going to pursue boxing and fighting, but he never did. In 1976, things started getting a little rocky for Samuel. He was arrested for Ray, that thing, an assault on a woman who actually survived one of his attacks. He was arrested in Missouri and the woman testified that he came up behind her, took an electrical cord, put it around her neck, strangled her, drove her to a secluded area, beat her up really, really bad, d did that to her and left her there. Now he thought she was dead, but she actually did survive and she remembered him. So she came in and testified against him, but he ended up only serving three months in prison. Now see, this was the thing for Samuel. He really went after women who he felt like nobody was going to care about or nobody was going to know. He went after mostly drug addicts, street walkers, mentally disabled, those types of people. So if they found a woman that was just dead somewhere in an alleyway or whatever, they would assume, especially if she was a known drug addict, 
that she just OD'd. They wouldn't go any further into it. And that's just what it was. And a lot of the times, these women who were out living this lifestyle, their family was not looking for them because they had been gone. They were, they were gone into the streets. So he was able to continuously do this and get away with it. But this is, like I said, when things started kind of slowing down a little bit for him. But when this woman survived and testified against him, this is when eyes kind of started to be on him, although he would not be captured until many years later. When he got out of serving that three months, he continued across multiple different states, strangling women, wooing them in, doing whatever he would do to them. He even said that sometimes he didn't actually, you know, take advantage of them in that way, that he would just pleasure himself over them, staring at their necks where he strangled them. Every single woman, all 93 women that he killed was all by strangulation. Like he had that obsession with it. In September of 1982, he came across a mentally disabled woman named Patricia Ann Mount. Witnesses would later testify that they saw Samuel and Patricia dancing together at a bar and that they left together, they drove off together, and that was the last person that anybody saw was Samuel with Patricia. However, her body was later found naked, dead, and strangled in a field somewhere. Investigators found Samuel, they interviewed him, they interrogated him, they were waiting for him to slip up and say anything, but he didn't. They would later say that Samuel carried himself cocky, very arrogant, definitely not phased, no remorse, like he had nothing, nothing to worry about, but they didn't have enough evidence or physical evidence to charge him at that point. They did find hair on Patricia. And so by 1983, they, they, the lab was examined and then they found a match between the hair and Samuel. At this time, he was in another state in jail. So they extradited him back and they charged him with murder for Patricia's murder. In 1984, they had a trial for Samuel. And of course he was proclaiming his innocence. And he was saying that he did not know her. He'd never seen her. He was in, he was in another state at the time. And the prosecution felt like they had a really, really, really good case. I mean, they had eyewitnesses showing him with her. They had the hair, and he had a shaky alibi because he had eyewitnesses and then he was saying that he was in another state. However, Samuel, during the trial, changed his story and said that, yes, he was with her. He danced with her and basically, you know, he was scared because he felt like he was being, you know, singled out and that they were just trying to pin something on him. And the jury acquitted him. They felt like there wasn't enough information because the defense was saying that, yes, he danced with her, but the hair just transferred from him to her. So it was a transferable evidence. So they did not have enough to convict him of murder. So they just acquitted him. And the prosecution was so infuriated because they knew that Samuel was going to kill again. But this only made Samuel more confident in what he was doing. Like he literally just got away with murder again. Again, and they had his hair evidence. They had eyewitnesses. Like, what more do you need, right? It would be decades before they were able to catch up with Samuel again. Samuel will later confess to in the 1980s that he did at least 10 more murders. Just, I mean, he, you got to understand he was in trial in 1984. Okay. So for the rest of the eighties, he killed at least 10 other people. Samuel was also able to get away with these murders or at least slip through the cracks because of the way that he did it. He strangled them. There was no murder weapon. There was no hot gun or a knife or anything because he used his own hands. And also because he was taking people that don't typically get reported immediately as missing and he would throw them in an alleyway somewhere by the time they were found they were typically decomposed and the investigators were having a hard time identifying these women to find out anything so all across these states there was just like these women that were dead in alleyways all over the place that he had killed now you guys remember the trial that i was just telling y'all about that trial that he had that he was found innocent he actually had that trial in January of 1984. In October of 1984, just a few months later, 
He ended up being arrested because a cop walked up to him and saw a woman passed out, well, unconscious in his car and bleeding. She had obviously been beaten up by him. He was getting ready to finish the job. And when they arrested him, they charged him. And he ended up serving two and a half years on that for attempted murder. So he serves that two and a half years, okay? And then still between all of this time that he spends with trial and being arrested, he still managed to murder over 10 women in the 1980s. Like, it's like he literally, as soon as he'd get out of jail, it's like he'd go to a bar and meet a woman and just, you, there was nothing stopping him, nothing slowing him down. As a matter of fact, in February of 1987, literally right after he is released from prison, a woman named Carol is found again, dead in an alleyway. Now this was in LA and this is where he had moved at this point and her name was Carol Alfred. When she was found dead in this alleyway, it is said that the only thing that she was wearing from the waist down down was a sock. Her body was beaten and battered and bruised and she had like drag marks on her body so they could tell that this woman obviously was not probably murdered here in this spot that somebody dumped her here somebody drug her here there was bodily fluids that was not hers found on her but at this point DNA testing was not necessarily a thing but they did save the DNA and we'll get to that later Carol Alfred is actually one of seven women that Samuel would later confess to killing in just that year, seven in that year. You guys, this is, this is nuts. He literally just went like, <sighs> in 1998, Samuel would plead guilty to robbery and serve two years in prison. And this is when you have to really understand that the only time Samuel was not killing people was when he was locked up. Is the only time he was not getting, you know, in like stealing, you know, taking women, dropping them, doing that is when he was in prison. In 2005, 35 years later from his first killing in 1970, he kills his last victim and this woman's name was Nancy. Samuel woos Nancy into his RV, probably being his charming self that he always has been, and he takes her to a Walmart parking lot and he strangles her there. From there, he does whatever he does to her body. He's driving down the road and he basically just kicks her body off into the side of the road and just leaves her there. In 2007, Samuel gets arrested again for some powder charges at this time. He is definitely on the FBI's radar, the cops' radar, but they just cannot catch him doing anything other than this little stuff. So at this point, the judge puts him on like this like drug program where he has to come in and check in and, you know, do classes or whatever. And of course, he just leaves the state, does whatever, never shows up. The judge puts a warrant out for his arrest, but it's actually a bench warrant. So this is a warrant that's not, they're not going to go and extradite him from other states and spend all the state's money or government money or whatever it is to bring this you know, addict at the time back. But nevertheless, they're still keeping their eyes on him. Finally, in January of 2013, there's a match of the DNA between the Carol Alfred and Samuel Little. Now I looked this up and it said that DNA evidence actually became a thing in 1986. So I have no idea why it took them until 2013. I mean, as many times as he was being arrested, like were they not swabbing his mouth? I have no idea how he got away. I don't know, maybe it just didn't get advanced until up until recently, but DNA evidence did become a thing according to documents on the internet in 1986. So how he got away with this for so long, I just don't even know. LA County felt like they finally got him. Found this DNA match between Samuel Little and now three women. So they arrested him on three murder charges and they felt like this is it. They got him this time. Of course, Samuel proclaims his innocence, but he doesn't just proclaim his innocence. He is cocky about it. He is very arrogant. He has no care in the world, no remorse, no anything. Anything. In September of 2014, Samuel went to trial for these murders, still proclaiming his innocence, just being wheeled in there. I mean, he's an old, he's 74 years old going to trial for murder, okay, for these three women. So Carol Alfred, who was 41 years old at the time of her murder, Guadalupe Apodica, 
I believe that's how you say her name. She was 46 at the time of her murder. And then Audrey Nelson, who was 35 at the time of her murder. All of these women's bodies were found strangled, beaten, and dumped in either alleyways or garages or stuff like that. During the trial, two different women came in and testified that he was the man that like had beaten and strangled them. So I guess that there was different times over the years where he beat and strangled. There was one woman who actually pretended to be dead, okay? So he strangled her. She pretended pretends to be dead. He does everything he does to her. He dumps her. Like, can you imagine like you're literally pretending to be dead while this, but she, it worked and she survived and she testified against him in court. The whole time he is just like, he, he is innocent. Guadalupe's her family was in there. There was a couple of the victims whose families were in there. Her son came in and there was different times where like Samuel would cuss at her son and say, I didn't kill your ma mother and stuff like that and like use profanity against him. And it was just terrible. Just saying that he was innocent and being nasty to the victim's families. One of the women that testified against him said that he beat her so bad that blood trickled from her eyes like tears, like she was bleeding from her tear ducts. Another woman said that he, she was working as a prostitute, but that night she was not working, but she was walking down the street for whatever reason. He came up behind her, he choked her, he pulled her into an alleyway, he beat her, he did everything to her, and then he left her body on a pile of trash, like trash heaps. The jury found Samuel guilty of all three murders and he ended up getting three consecutive life sentences, which is, you know, back to back sentences. You can either get concurrent where they all run together or consecutive where they run back to back. And during the sentencing, he yelled, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. I'm not guilty. And as he was being wheeled off, that day after he got sentenced, everybody was clapping and he raised his fist in the air. Like this man killed almost a hundred women and the audacity to still look at these families in the face and cuss them out. Like they've done something wrong. Like He really tried it y'all really did try it. Now, how did we find out about all of these murders? Well, it wasn't until 2008, Okay, 2018, a Texas Ranger named James Holland began interviewing him. Now, at first, Samuel was not having it, okay? He was very hardcore, did not really want to talk to him, but, but James continued to go visit him. He was able to, like, pull him in, like, you know, certain rooms or whatever because he was an investigator. He started befriending Samuel in a way. He would bring him in pizza and bring him in like Dr. Pepper and stuff. And Samuel began to soften to James. And he told him that he hated cops. He hated the law. He hated authority, all of that. But he became friends with James. Now, James would later say, you know, that that's, that's a tactic, right? That he knew he was sitting across from a cold-blooded murderer. And, you know, you got to kind of do what you got to do to get in information out of him and he's so glad that he did and the reason why he went to interview him was because he wanted to find out if he had anything to do with one murder that he was investigating but when Samuel like opened up to him that's when he confessed to all of these murders 93 women he was even able to like draw and sketch these women which was later found out to be that Samuel had a photographic memory now you guys this man is almost 80 years old at this point and he did all of these drawings these color drawings that were very detailed to you know him and in all of the drawings if you guys see them they all had the necks showing right like you have to catch that part like he drew the whole entire neck on these women he gave interviews and I will leave them linked down below as well for you guys to listen to him that's where to me I could really tell how charming this man was when he gave these interviews he just talked about these women like oh man I loved her I forget her name oh wait I think it was Ruth Okay. She was a heavy set, big old yellow girl. You know, you know, I loved her, but yet he killed her. Like it was so strange, you guys. He ended up dying just last year in December of 2020. So just a few months ago, a couple months ago, actually, of basically natural causes. He was 80 years old and he had diabetes. He had some heart issues and other health issues. 
However, 60 of those women have been identified and, you know, they were cold. A lot of them were cold cases. So he was able to help the families get closure, but there is still another 33 women that he admitted to that nobody's claimed. And they're thinking that it's because, you know, family members, family, some family members are embarrassed as sad as that is to say that maybe they had a daughter or a sister or whatever that ran off into the streets and they're not claiming them. You know, they, they just felt like, okay, well, she disappeared, and then that was it. I went on my car, and uh, this white girl come out behind the building, you know, in my trunk. She walked over to me, say, uh, come on, you know, can you take me to Miami? Describe this girl to me. She was white, blonde hair, dishwater, dishwater blonde, they go, in short. Couple final thoughts here. I wanted to talk about the fact that he was so charming again. And you guys go watch the videos and you'll see what I'm talking about. Like when you watch him, he's he's very charismatic, in my opinion. I think he's very charismatic. You know what I mean? And I think that a lot of the times we think that serial killers or we think that, you know, or, or people, maybe people that don't watch true crime, right? People that, you know, whatever. When you think serial killer and you think, or like when I've told you when I was in prison, like the, some of the smartest people that you, you would think are in prison, right? This man, again, like Teddy and so many other ones, Chris Watts, Chris Coleman, these are what you would look at and think like, this is a normal person. Like when you think serial killer, you think Freddy Cougar, the boogeyman, but it's really not. It could literally be your boss, okay? And some of us probably feel like our bosses are in their spare time, right? It could be your next door neighbor. It could be your husband. It could be your wife, you know? And I think that that is the scariest part is these psychopaths and stuff like if you've ever been friends with one and I have and I learned the hard way with that you know what I mean it's like they're very I don't know that's the most terrifying thing to me of all of it is how charming and loved these people are I mean Ted old Teddy was like very much loved in his community nobody would ever thought Chris Watts Nobody would have ever, ever, ever thought. And that, and he was having those thoughts for weeks, right? Jeffrey D., Jeffrey Dahmer, the things that he did, nobody would have ever thought. And then if you watch the interviews with Jeffrey, he's very well put together. He seems like, I don't know, you guys, what do y'all think about that? Is that not wild or what? So what do y'all think about this whole story? I need to know everything wild. America's most prolific serial killer. He killed more people than Jeffrey Dahmer, Chris Watts, uh, Chris Coleman, uh, Ted Bundy, all of them combined. And nobody even, he got away with it for 35 years. Insane. In absolute same. So you guys, y'all are already here. You might as well watch another video. I know y'all, I know y'all haven't seen them all. I know you haven't seen every one of them. <laughs> as always, my loves, please do not forget to like this video. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye.